Welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing the vestibular system. Okay, so we've so far discussed the otolith organs, we've discussed the saccule and the utricle, and we've seen that uh, these two otolith organs, they have uh, these sensory portions known as the maculae, and the job of these maculae is to uh, encode information that the brain can use uh, to understand the static orientation of the head within three-dimensional space or with respect to gravity and also linear motion of the head as well um, and we've discussed the fact that it's quite difficult just with the vestibular information in fact impossible with just the vestibular information to distinguish between static head tilt and uh, linear motion uh, however you'll have other information available to you, such as the proprioceptors within the muscles of the neck, which will be able to help you understand whether your head is just on a tilt or whether you are actually moving. Okay, so, um, and we've seen the mechanism by which it actually encodes that information. We've seen that these maculae have these otolithic membranes on top of them, and then the otolithic membrane will move around depending on uh, your static head tilt or your linear motion, and this will result in a certain pattern of activation and inactivation of hair cells, and consequently of the bipolar neurons that innervate those hair cells, and that activation and inactivation of the bipolar neurons that innervate the hair cells is what the central nervous system can then use to uh, gain information from. Okay, so that's the way in which the otolith organs work, and of course you'll have those on both sides of the head. You have two uh, vestibular systems, one on each side of the head, and each of them will have a saccule and a utricle, and it's all about detecting static head uh, position with respect to gravity and linear motion of the head. Right, so next what we want to move on to is discussing the semicircular ducts uh, within the semicircular canals, and we want to discuss what are these semicircular ducts going to do, firstly, what sort of sensory information are they going to give us, and then what is the sensory structure within the sen uh, semicircular ducts, and how is it actually going to encode this information uh, that I've said it is going to encode. Okay, so let me just get a new piece of paper and then we'll start to study this. Right, so let's begin. Um, just get it in the right position. Okay, so let me start by just giving you the answer of what the semicircular ducts are actually going to do. The semicircular ducts encode information about rotational motions. I've told you that the utricle and the saccule, the otolith organs, are all about encoding information of linear motion, motion in a straight line. The semicircular ducts, they encode information about rotational motion, where either the entire body is rotating about, or the head is rotating, uh, and the body might not be rotating, so you might just be moving your head. Okay, so they're going to encode information about rotational motion. So, uh, after giving the answer away of what uh, the semicircular ducts are actually going to do, what I want to do is take a step back and talk about which portion of the semicircular ducts is actually responsible for the sensory transduction of this information about rotational motion, and then we'll have a look at how it actually achieves that. So firstly, where is the sensory apparatus in the semicircular ducts? So the sensory apparatus in the semicircular ducts is in the ampullae. So if I get back up my picture of the um, entire labyrinth here, so remember, each one of the semicircular ducts within the semicircular canals has this expansion just before it joins back up with the utricle here, and that's known as an ampulla, the plural being ampullae. Okay, uh, and it's in these ampullae that you're going to find the sensory apparatus, which is actually going to transduce information about rotational motion of the head. So each one of the semicircular ducts has an ampullae. Uh, so here is the anterior semicircular ducts ampullae, or ampulla rather, and here's the posterior one, and its ampulla is over there, and the horizontal one, its ampulla is over here. Okay, so what I now want to do is draw one of these ampulla out, uh, or ampullae out, 
Uh, sorry about getting confused with the singular and the plural. Bear with me. Uh, so what I want to do is draw one of these amplae out and have a look at what's inside of it because inside of it is going to be the sensory uh, apparatus which can uh, transduce information about rotational motion into electrical uh, signals. Okay, so I'll draw this here. So here is going to be one of these ampullae, or an ampulla. Okay, and at a certain portion, the membrane sort of folds inwards like this, and this is going to be the sensory portion of this ampulla. And it's actually going to be known as the crista, plural cristae, so another awful plural for me to get confused with. Okay, so this is the crista of this ampulla, and as I say, the plural is cristae. Okay, so let me give the membrane an actual thickness here. So rather than just having it represented by a line, I'm going to actually give the cells a thickness here. So here are these cuboidal epithelial cells lining uh, this uh, vestibular structure here. Okay, so this is the membrane. Right, there we go. So this is the semicircular duct going off here. This is the bit that will be attaching onto the utricle here. Okay, this is the ampulla. And this special portion where the membrane has, as you can see, invaginated inwards, there's this little hump, if you like, uh, going into the endolymph-filled cavity here, that's known as the crista. Now, let me just separate the cells up here. So here are these epithelial cells. Now, the epithelial cells on this portion called the crista, they're going to be the special epithelial cells. And what sort of epithelial cells do you think they're going to be? Have a guess. They are, of course, going to be hair cells. So on this special portion, you're not just going to have normal old epithelial cells, you're going to have hair cells, and these are of course going to be the cells which are going to transduce the information, the mechanical information about rotational motion of the head uh, into electrical signals. So they will have uh, bipolar neurons innovating them. So I could even draw a few of these bipolar neurons in. So here in yellow, if that shows up, I might go over it again in orange because in this light it probably isn't going to show up. So in orange, here are bipolar neurons innovating the bottom of those hair cells. Okay, right, uh, and we'll find out when those hair cells are going to be activated later on. At the moment, just go with it. We're just having a look at the anatomy. Okay, so there is this special portion of the ampulla known as the criste, uh, or the crista, singular, and um, this is where you have hair cells present. And these hair cells are going to again have uh, polarized cilia. So they're going to have one kinocilium and lots of stereocilia, and again the stereocilia are going to increase in height towards the side where the kinocilium is. So that then begs the question, what is the orientation of the hair cells on this portion uh, here, this crista portion? Well, they're all going to be oriented in the same direction, unlike as we saw with the maculae of the otolith organs. The difficulty here arises from the fact that for the different ampullae of the different semicircular ducts, the orientation is going to be different. So I'm going to just redraw out this picture of the semicircular ducts coming off the utricle, and then I can show you the orientation of the hair cells for each of the cristae of the ampullae of the semicircular ducts. Okay, so here we go. So here's the portion which is common to both the anterior and posterior semicircular canals. And then we come down here, like so, and then here is the ampulla of the anterior semicircular canal, like so. And here's the portion of the posterior semicircular canal coming off there. Then we'll have the horizontal semicircular canal here, so here's its ampulla. And then it'll go backwards like so, and then connect onto the vestibule further back, like that. Okay, and then finally, to complete the picture up, let's just complete the posterior one. So it's going posteriorly, remember at that angle, approximately 45 degrees uh, away from the sagittal plane. And then we'll have the ampulla at the back here coming onto the uh, vestibule, like so. Okay, so this is the bony portion. We've got the bony vestibule and the bony semicircular uh, canals. Uh, now let me add on the membranous portion, so here we'll have the utricle, 
then here comes the anterior semicircular canal, the ampulla firstly, then the rest of the anterior semicircular canal, then here's the posterior semicircular canal coming off here, and then it's ampulla is down here, and then here's the horizontal semicircular canal, it's ampulla's there, and then the rest of the canal is coming off there and it will come back onto the utricle down there. Okay, so there's the picture we need. So, each of these ampullae here, the ampulla of the anterior semicircular duct, the ampulla of the uh, horizontal semicircular duct, and the ampulla of the posterior semicircular duct, all of them will have cristae. And the orientation of the hair cells is going to be different in these different ampullae. Okay, so we'll start off with the horizontal one here. So if we look at the ampulla of the horizontal semicircular canal, the hair cells in there are going to be oriented towards the utricle in that case. Okay, so they'll have their kinocilia pointing towards the utricle, and uh, then their stereocilia, their smaller stereocilia, will be oriented towards the semicircular duct side. That's the opposite way round for the cristae of the um, anterior and posterior semicircular ducts ampullae. So in the case of the anterior semicircular duct here, the hair cells of its crista will be oriented away from the utricle. Okay, so they'll have their kinocilia oriented towards the semicircular duct and their smaller stereocilia pointing towards the utricle. And it's the same for the posterior semicircular duct i.e. they'll have their hair cells oriented away from the utricle, so their kinocilia will be pointing towards the semicircular duct, and their smaller stereocilia will be pointed towards the utricle. Okay, right, so that's the orientation of the hair cells, uh, then, uh, of the cristae, of the different ampullae of the different semicircular ducts. Right, so for the purposes of this picture, I'm not going to attempt to actually uh, draw the hairs with their orientation. I'm just going to put some hairs on here like so. So I'm not showing the gradient of the hairs. I'm just sort of being crude with my picture. There are the hairs, but we've discussed the fact that the hair cells will have this gradient, and we've now discussed the orientation of the uh, gradient in these different examples here. Okay, right. So... So far we've seen that uh, each of the ampullae will have a region known as the cristae where there are hair cells. This portion will invaginate into the endolymph cavity here and the hair cells will be innervated by uh, bipolar neurons. Now the next structure that I need to tell you about is effectively the equivalent of the otolithic membrane now. And it's a structure known as the cupola. And the cupola is a gelatinous diaphragm that completely traverses the lumen of the ampulla. Okay, so this yellow structure here, and again I've used a colour uh, subconsciously that isn't probably going to show up particularly well in this light. I will add an additional colour. Again, I'll go over it in orange. So here is the cupola. All of this, and it's a gelatinous diaphragm. So again, it's a gelatinous material that is forming a diaphragm that completely traverses the entire lumen. I, if I was a little man standing here, I could not move over to here. I cannot pass this without sort of oozing my way through this gelatinous diaphragm, which is called the cupola. Okay, and hopefully you can see the way I've drawn this is look at these hairs of the hair cells of the cristae here, or of the crista. Um, they are implanted into the cupola. Okay, so if the cupola was to move, then the hairs would move, i.e. the hairs would bend in a certain direction, and we know that that will change the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane of the hair cells, and will lead to changes in the amount of neurotransmitter being released by the hair cells, and therefore changes in the firing rate of the bipolar neurons innervating those hair cells. Okay, so we're starting to see how this might all fit together. Right, so there's the anatomy then. Let's now actually go over how this does all fit together. How do um, you transduce information about rotational motion into electrical signals? Well, 
Here it's important to understand that the semicircular ducts are going to work in pairs. However, I'll leave off with that thought in a moment for a moment, and I'll just talk about one semicircular duct and then we'll go a little bit more advanced. But we're going to have to go to the other side as well, and in fact I think I'll spend a little bit of time drawing a mirror image of this picture for the opposite side of the head, the left side of the head, in order to discuss that better. But for now, let's just keep it simple and let's talk about one simple rotational movement and the horizontal semicircular duct here. So the simple movement that we're going to try and understand how it's going to be transduced into electrical information to a pattern of uh, electrical activity in these bipolar neurons um, is going to be a rotational head movement. So here we are, here's my little man, and let's imagine that his head is going to rotate to the right. Now, we want to work out how this little man is going to be aware that his head is moving to the right. And of course, he could voluntarily move his head to the right, and in that case his brain would already know that his head was going to move to the right. So let's imagine that someone has come up behind him and forcibly moved his head to the right against his will. Okay, He had no awareness that they were about to do this, so he, his motor system has not given this as a command, so the reason he's going to find out that his head is moving to the right isn't because his motor system knows that it should be moving to the right. In addition, let's say his eyes are closed, so visual information's out, you would still know that your head was being moved to the right, and one of the major ways in which you're going to know that your head is being moved to the right is through uh, the semicircular ducts, transducing the information and sending electrical signals to the brain. Okay, so let's have a look at how this is going to work. So the major semicircular duct that's going to be involved uh, here, because we're just moving in this horizontal plane effectively, okay, we're moving the head to the right in a horizontal plane, we're not moving it backwards or forwards or to the sides, we're just moving it uh, rightward in a horizontal plane. The main one that's going to be involved are the horizontal semicircular ducts, and it's actually going to involve both of them, the two on either side. However, um, we will for now just have a look at this one on the right hand side. We'll come back to thinking about the fact that you have this bilaterally and the fact that the semicircular ducts are going to work in pairs. Okay, so let's see how this is going to be transduced then by this right horizontal semicircular duct then. So when you move your head to the right like this, again everything is to do with inertia the endolymph inside these vestibular membrane bound structures is subject to inertia like everything else in the universe. So when you move your head to the right, it doesn't want to move with you. When, you acceler when your head is accelerated round to the right like this, it's n going to resist motion. Okay, It's going to resist that acceleration. So there's a possibility that this is going to end up in fact, there's not just a possibility, it will happen that the fluid will end up moving leftward relative to the vestibular system. So when you move your head right, the entire vestibular apparatus here, i.e. the bony vestibular structure and the membranous labyrinth components, they'll all move with the head because they're fastened in place. But the endolymph inside, this can move Okay, this will have the inertia and it will tend to move now in the opposite direction. It will tend to rotate in the opposite direction relative to uh, the membranous labyrinth. So what's going to happen is when the membranous labyrinth, when indeed the horizontal semicircular duct here moves rightward, it's turning around rightward, the fluid in there is going to move to the leftward relative to it. So if you imagine just sort of turning this around, you can imagine that the fluid will be flowing in the opposite direction inside of it. And it's not because the fluid is actually moving relative to 3D space, it's because the semicircular duct is moving and then, then the fluid has in it, its inertia is making it stay behind and therefore it's moving relative to the semicircular duct. So what's actually going to happen is when you move your head, rotate your head to the right, the fluid inside that horizontal semicircular duct is going to move round to the left, it's going to rotate round to the left. I, it's going to rotate towards the ampulla here. So what's going to happen? It's all going to be smacking up against the cupola here. 
Okay, so it's going to be pushing the cupola in this direction towards the utricle. What's that going to do? It's going to cause all the hair cells to bend in this direction. Now, I've talked about how the hair cells of this of the crista in the ampulla of the horizontal semicircular duct here, how they are oriented with their kinocilia towards the utricle and their smaller stereocilia away from the utricle. So that means that the stereocilia are going to bend towards the kinocilium uh, when we have this motion of the cupola towards the utricle. So that's going to lead to those hair cells in the crista of this horizontal semicircular canal here all becoming depolarized and therefore they're going to release more glutamate their bipolar neurons are going to start firing at a much higher rate okay so you're going to get these bipolar neurons firing like crazy and that's the signal that the brain needs to say oh look this uh, right semicircular duct here horizontal semicircular duct to be precise uh, has been activated that evidently shows us that we are moving around to the left because that's the only way that this will become active. If you were to move your head in the other direction, if you were to rotate your head round to the left, think what would happen instead in this case. If you rotate your head round to the left, imagine rotating this all around to the left. Now what's going to happen is the fluid inside that horizontal semicircular duct is going to effectively move round to the right it'll push the cupola towards the semicircular duct, so instead the cupola will be going in this direction. Okay, that will move all of the um, hairs, but this time it will be bending the kinocilia towards the smaller stereocilia, i.e. that will cause hyperpolarization of the hair cells, and therefore uh, these bipolar neurons will be receiving less glutamate in there, frequency of firing action potentials will go down. Okay, and in fact, that actually signals to the brain, because all of these bipolar neurons have become inactivated, surely that now means that our head must have rotated round to the left. So this is how we are actually encoding this rotational information um, with these semicircular duct apparatuses. Okay, now let's think about what will be happening in the other two semicircular ducts here, so the anterior and the posterior semicircular ducts when we rotate. Well, they're not going to be activated or inhibited in any way because they're in the wrong planes. The reason it's the horizontal semicircular canals uh, on both sides, and I hope you realize that the left horizontal semicircular canal or duct uh, is also going to be being activated or inhibited with these rotational motions, and it will be the converse of what's happening on this side, but I'll go over that in more detail in a moment. Okay, But the anterior and the posterior ones aren't going to be because they're in the wrong planes. These ones are in the right planes to detect this sort of rotational movement because you are rotating in the same plane as that um, semicircular duct is present in, and therefore the inertia will beautifully work in that case. If you imagine what's going to happen in the, let's say, anterior semicircular duct when we rotate round to the right. The fluid will still have inertia, but it'll be sort of pushing in this direction. So the fluid will be pushing in this direction, therefore it's not going to actually move relative to the semicircular duct, it's just going to be pushing in that direction. Okay, it's tr going to be trying to move in the leftward direction, but it's not going to end up moving around the semicircular duct because the semicircular duct isn't in the right plane. That's why the horizontal semicircular ducts are involved in transducing this sort of motion into electrical signals because they sit in the correct plane so that when you make these motions, the fluid in those semicircular ducts will actually move relative to the semicircular ducts, whereas in these other ones that are in the wrong plane, the fluid will still have that inertia, but it's not going to move relative to the semicircular duct. Uh, it's not going to move down here, for instance, because why would it move down there? It's not the right plane. Okay, and I hope that's clear. Right, so that's giving you a taster of how these semicircular ducts then are going to work. So the anterior and the posterior ones, they will detect rotational movement in different planes. So for instance, these will rotate, uh, sorry, these will transduce information about you rotating your head backwards and forwards in certain planes, and we'll come to this in more detail just now. Okay, so before we do, let's just draw a mirror image of this, because I now want to include 
the other side because the semicircular ducts they work in pairs. The horizontal one will work with the other horizontal one. The anterior one here will work with the posterior one on the other side. The posterior one here will work with the anterior one on the other side. And I want to explain that now. So here I'm going to now draw the left-sided equivalent. So here's where uh, the anterior um, semicircular canal is coming off, like so. And here is its ampulla, and I apologise if this isn't perfectly symmetric, but I'll try my best. Here's the posterior one coming off there. Okay, now what we want is the horizontal semicircular canal. Here's its ampulla. Here is it going round, and then it will attach on back there. And then we'll finish by putting the posterior one, and it hasn't become perfectly symmetrical, but never mind. Near enough, here's its the posterior semicircular canal's ampulla. Connecting on like that. Here we go. Okay, that will do, and I'll just uh, add on the actual uh, membranous portions. So here is the utricle in blue. Here, here is the anterior semicircular duct and its ampulla. Here, here is the horizontal semicircular duct's ampulla and the rest of the horizontal semicircular duct. Here is the posterior semicircular duct's ampulla and the rest of the posterior semicircular duct. Okay, right. So, what happens is these work in pairs. So we'll start with the simplest pair first. We'll start with the two horizontal semicircular canals. And let me just add a little bit more uh, onto these two pictures. So I want to make very apparent the orientation of the hair cells of the cristae in these ampullae. So remember, the horizontal orientation is that the uh, hair cells are oriented towards the utricle. So here we are in these great big obscene red arrows. And then the other two, they're oriented away from the utricle. So here for the anterior semicircular canals and here for the posterior semicircular canals. Okay, so those orientations are very important, so I want them put on with these big arrows. So, the horizontal semicircular canals, these work as a pair, okay? When you rotate your head round to the right, this horizontal semicircular canal, the one on the right side, is going to be activated, and this one is going to be inhibited. And let me explain why. So, when we rotate our head round to the right, you can imagine both of these rotating round to the right. Okay, the fluid in the horizontal semicircular canals will move to the left, round to the left, relative to the duct. Okay, so the fluid here will move round to the left, the fluid here will move round to the left. When the fluid here moves round to the left, that will deviate the cupola towards the utricle and therefore will result in activation of the hair cells here because the hair cells are oriented towards the utricle. Okay, so you'll get loads of act activated bipolar neurons on this side. What will happen on the other side, the exact opposite? The fluid will go round to the left, which is now away from the uh, ampulla here, round the semicircular duct. Okay, so round to the left in this way. Remember, they're forming like a loop, so here it comes around here, and then it's going like that on the other side. So that means that the cupola will be deviated away from the utricle, okay? And therefore, you're bending the hair cells in the opposite way. You're bending the kinocilia towards the smaller stereocilia. You're inactivating them, i.e. the bipolar neurons on this side will all be inactivated. So rightward motion, moving your head round to the right, results in activation of the bipolar neurons from this side and inactivation of the bipolar neurons from that side. And the brain will interpret that as my head, or indeed my entire body, if the entire body is rotating round to the right, is moving to the right. And let me just straighten this up. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, then let's think, just for a complete picture, what would happen if we moved our head round to the left? Well, the activation, the pattern of activation would be the exact opposite this time. If we moved our head round to the left, then of course, imagine rotating these round to the left, the fluid inside would move round to the right. So here the fluid would be moving round to the right, this time it would be coming in this direction, i.e. towards the ampulla and the utricle, and therefore it would bend this cupola towards the utricle, and hence, for the same explanations we've been through already, you'd get activation of the bipolar neurons here. On this side, as I've already explained in the singleton case, um, when we move our head 
round to the left, the fluid will move round to the right, it will move therefore away from the ampulla round this way, and the capoda will deviate away from the utricle, and that will result in inactivation of all the bipolar neurons from this side. And the brain will say, oh look, I'm getting loads of rapid action potentials from the bipolar neurons on the left-hand side, in the far fewer uh, action potentials from the bipolar neurons on the right side, and therefore my head must have moved around to the left-hand side. Okay, so the horizontal semicircular ducts then, they work as a pair to detect horizontal um, motion, rotational motion of the head, or indeed the entire body. Uh, it's the head that's important though. Okay, now the more complicated story, the anterior and the posterior semicircular canals. So I think here it's helpful to actually draw a picture from above of the positions, remind you of the planes that these canals lie in. So remember if I draw a picture from above, this is a simple picture that I can draw here. So just to orient you, this is anterior, this is posterior, this is right, this is left, we're looking from above. This is supposed to be the plane that the anterior semicircular canal on the right hand side is in, and this is the plane that the right posterior semicircular canal is in. On the other hand, on the left hand side, this is the plane that the left anterior semicircular canal is in, and this is the plane that the left posterior semicircular canal is in. Okay, and remember they're approximately 45 degrees away from the sagittal line down the middle, so this one is 45 degrees in that direction, whereas the posterior one is 45 degrees like that. Okay, and you can see now how beautifully this works, because this one is in the same plane as this one, so if I was to rotate my head forwards at that sort of angle of 45 degrees, so it's not just rotating your head simply forwards. Unfortunately, the planes are a bit more complicated than the simplest planes you could imagine. If you were designing this vestibular system, the nice way to do it would be to have uh, two in the transverse plane, as indeed we do have with the horizontal semicircular canals, then to have two in the sagittal plane and two in the coronal plane. However, we don't quite have that, unfortunately. Instead, we have these planes that are uh, 45 degrees out of sync with the sagittal and coronal planes. So it would have been nice if they had gone in the sagittal and coronal planes, but that's not the way it works. So instead, uh, these two are in this plane that is sort of 45 degrees um, away from the sagittal plane, indeed the other two are in uh, the s a plane 45 degrees away from the sagittal plane in the opposite direction. So just now drawing someone's head here, so if this is the anterior side, this is the posterior side, and we're looking from above, right, left, then in order to just activate these two canals, this anterior one on the right and this posterior one on the left, you need to rotate your head in this sort of plane, so you need to either go forwards in this sort of plane, in that sort of direction, okay, and hopefully you can sort of mime this movement for yourself, uh, or you need to go backwards, you need to lean your head backwards in that sort of plane. And to activate the other two, the anterior one on the left hand side and the posterior one on the uh, right hand side, you need to move your head in this sort of plane here, if you just want to activate those. If you move your head in the coronal or the sagittal planes, these two planes here, you'll end up activating all four of these canals in a mixed sort of way, and I'll come on to that uh, after we've done the simple planes. Okay, so we'll start with these two strange planes, but they're the simpler ones because if you move your head in these planes, you'll just activate a pair of semicircular canals rather than more than a pair. Okay, so let's think about this blue plane then, the anterior one on the right-hand side and the posterior one on the left-hand side. So let's say I move my head forwards in this plane, so I try to move my head in this plane at this strange angle. Uh, what will happen? I'm moving forwards. So let's think about this. Which of these canals is going to be activated and which is going to be inactivated? And that's the clue. It's always one will be activated and one will be inactivated, just like we saw for the horizontal semicircular ducts. Okay, so let's think about what's going to be happening. So we are moving everything anteriorly in this strange plane. So we're moving the um, anterior semicircular canal like this. 
okay? We're moving it in its same plane, and therefore the fluid inside it will be moving in the opposite direction, i.e. it will be going backwards, like so, okay? i.e. it will be going away from the ampulla, okay? Now what does that mean? That the cupola of this ampulla will therefore deviate away from the utricle, because the fluid's moving in this direction, away from the utricle, okay, and towards the semicircular duct. And we know that that's going to activate the hair cells here, because the hair cells are oriented in that same direction. This is the direction that you need to move the capola in order to activate them, because that's the orientation of those head, hair cells. They have the kinocilia facing the semicircular duct, and their smaller stereocilia towards the utricle. So that will activate the anterior semicircular uh, duct on the right-hand side here. Now let's go to the posterior semicircular duct on the left-hand side. Okay, so again, you'll be moving it like this, okay? Remember, we are moving our head forward and anteriorly, so you'll be moving it kind of like that, okay? So the fluid will end up moving like this in this posterior uh, semicircular duct here, and therefore will move towards the ampulla. And therefore, uh, the capola will deviate towards the utricle, and we know that that's going to inactivate the hair cells here, because the hair cells are oriented away from the utricle. Okay, so the firing of uh, the bipolar neurons innervating these hair cells will go down. So this one will be activated, this one will be inactivated, if we move our head forwards in that case. Okay, now let's think about what would happen if we moved our head backwards in this plane. So we tilted our head backwards in this strange plane. Then, you can guess, hopefully, what would happen. The anterior semicircular duct on the right-hand side will be inactivated, and the posterior one on the left-hand side will be activated. Let's, again, just go through the reasoning, because I want this to be really clear in your head. Okay, so if we're moving our head backwards, then imagine tilting it all around in that way. The fluid will be coming forwards towards the utricle this time, i.e. it will bend the capola of the anterior one towards the utricle, and that will inactivate those hair cells, inactivate those bipolar neurons, innervating those hair cells. In the case of the posterior semicircular duct on the left-hand side here, we're now moving our head backwards, like that, so the fluid will end up moving Sorry, let me do that again. So we'll be moving our head backwards like this. So the fluid will be moving in this direction, away from the utricle, like this, in the opposite direction to which we're moving. Uh, and therefore, what you'll get is the capola deviating away from the utricle, and that is the direction that we need it to deviate in to get these hair cells activated, and therefore those bipolar neurons will activate. Okay, and it's the equivalent on the other side. It's exactly the same, but we're just swapping to now having the left anterior one here and the right posterior one, and now we'd be in this green plane here. So I won't go through that. I won't bore you by going through it because it is just the mirror image, but go through it in your head to make sure you understand it. What I want to finish this discussion with is a discussion of what would happen if you moved your head in the sagittal plane, which is the more normal plane? This is the plane that you move your head in when you're nodding, for instance. So when you nod, you're rotating your head in this plane backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. So what would happen there? Well, in this case, you're going to get um, fluid moving to a lesser degree in both the and both of the anterior semicircular ducts and in both of the posterior semicircular ducts this time. So you won't just activate one pair, you'll activate all four of these semicircular ducts here, i.e. you'll activate two pairs, and that's the way the brain would be able to interpret um, movement uh, in this plane. So let's say we moved our head downwards in this case. Okay, so we moved our head forwards in the for in the downward portion of a nod. What will happen in that case? Well, we're moving everything forward, so the anterior semicircular canals, they will be coming forwards like this, and that means the fluid will be going backwards. Okay, so the fluid in the anterior semicircular ducts will be going backwards, i.e. away from the utricles, and that would result in activation of both of these anterior uh, semicircular ducts, cristae. Okay, but to a lesser degree than you'd have got activation if the movement had been in one of their sole planes. So both of them are going to be activated, but to a lesser degree than they would have been activated when we were discussing them in these blue and green planes. So those are going to be activated. Then what's going to happen to the two posterior semicircular um, 
ducts. Well, again, everything's moving forward, so the fluid's moving backwards, so the fluid will be moving backwards in these posterior semicircular ducts, again, to a lesser degree than it would have been if we were in one of the perfect planes, and therefore it will be moving towards the utricles, and it will be inactivating these uh, cristae of these posterior semicircular ducts. Okay, so what you get is activation of both of the anterior semicircular ducts, and you get inactivation of both of the posterior semicircular ducts in that case, and that's how the brain uh, will be able to interpret that you were moving your head forwards in the sagittal plane. And equivalently, if you moved your head backwards in the sagittal plane, you get inactivation of these two and activation of the two posterior ones, and that would be interpreted uh, like so. Okay, and you can go through what would be happening uh, in the case of the uh, coronal plane as well. So, this then is how we actually translate um, rotation of the head into um, electrical signals that can then be interpreted by the brain using these semicircular duct systems. So this is the sensory apparatus of the semicircular duct systems. And it's really important that you understand that the semicircular ducts work in these planes. They operate in these planes uh, and in these pairs. So the two horizontal ones work in the plane and they're in the horizontal plane. The anterior ones work with the contralateral posterior ones because they're in the same plane and overall if you rotate your head in a certain direction you'll get a certain pattern of activation and inactivation of the different uh, semicircular um, duct pairs and if one of them's activated its pair, uh, its partner will be inactivated and the pattern of how uh, strong the deviation in a certain pair of um, semicircular ducts is, um, the pattern for all three of the pairs of semicircular ducts, that can be interpreted to work out exactly uh, how the head is rotating. So the semicircular ducts then, they encode information about how the head is actually rotating now. So it's important you understand the otolith organs, they encode information about static head tilt. These only encode information about um, tilt that is dynamic. Okay, so dynamic uh, rotation of the head rather than static rotation of the head. Dynamic changes in orientation of the head, whereas the otolith organs are static uh, orientation of the head and, as well as linear motion. Okay, so we've now been through then how these different parts, these different sensory apparatuses of the vestibular system are actually going to encode this information uh, into electrical signals that can be sent to the brain. What I now want to go through is the neuroanatomy of where is this information actually going to go to. And the first pathway that I want to look at is how is all this information going to go up to the cerebral cortex for processing uh, where it will be used consciously. It will uh, give us our conscious awareness of our current orientation of our head with respect to gravity and conscious awareness of our current rotational and linear motions of our head. So we'll go over the conscious pathway first, then we'll go on to the vestibular ocular reflex pathway and then the vestibular spinal reflex pathway.